If you watch this series consistently, there's something you've heard me say a hundred million times. That filmmaking is all about adaptation, about making the most of what you have at every stage in the process of creating a film, and rolling with the punches when things go wrong. However, you should also be taking steps to prevent things from going wrong, particularly things that are in your control. Because the further down the process you go, the harder it becomes to correct mistakes. Poor planning is pretty stressful to make up for when shooting, and bad footage is difficult, if not impossible, to fix in post. One of the easiest and most effective ways to make sure you're not creating problems that you'll have to fix later on is to have a checklist that you go through before pressing record. A collection of quick adjustments and settings that can absolutely ruin your footage if done wrong, so that you can make sure they don't absolutely ruin your footage by doing them right. Some of the most obvious are frame rate and shutter speed, particularly the relationship between them. As a general rule, your shutter speed should be double your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 24 frames a second, use a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second. Shooting at 60, use a shutter of 1 120th of a second, and so on. So whenever you change your frame rate, make sure you change your shutter speed to match. So if you're shooting in 60 frames a second with a shutter of 1 120th of a second, and then drop down to 24 frames a second, make sure you bump your shutter back down to 1 50th of a second. If you don't and you end up with a shutter speed that's higher than it should be, you're not gonna have realistic motion blur in your footage. Your footage could appear choppy or even wobbly if the camera's moving. Also, really make sure that you avoid the worst case scenario of, for example, shooting in 24 frames a second, then switching up to 60 frames a second, but still having a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second at 60 frames a second having a shutter speed lower than your frame rate. A good easy solution to prevent any of that from happening to you is to have preset modes for each frame rate you shoot in. So on my camera, I have one for 24 frames a second and one for 60 frames a second. So on the mode dial, if I switch over to mode one, which is 24 frames a second, the camera automatically sets the shutter speed to 1 50th of a second. If I switch up to mode two, which is 60 frames a second, it automatically goes back up to 1 120th of a second, and I just use an ND filter on the lens to adjust the exposure for either one. That strategy will unfortunately not work for these next two settings, which are white balance and exposure. These ones you'll need to frequently adjust between shots, and they are kind of easy to neglect and can make your life a whole lot harder in editing, particularly color grading, if you set them wrong. The best way to make sure you're not messing up your white balance or exposure is to take advantage of your camera's view assist features, all of those little bits and bobs that appear on the screen while you're shooting. You can keep track of your exposure by enabling either the histogram, which shows you a quick snapshot of the exposure throughout your image so you can make sure you're not under or overexposing too much, or my preference is to use the light meter at the bottom of the screen. This tells you a quick like numerical value of the exposure. It's also really helpful to turn on zebras, which will indicate when your highlights are blown out and overexposed to a point that you won't be able to pull them back in the grade. If you're shooting in like a flat log profile, the image you see on your screen is really desaturated, really low contrast, which can make it pretty tough to actually tell if your exposure or your white balance are off a bit. So I would always recommend enabling a preview LUT in your camera, which will usually throw on this kind of neutral Rec. 709 LUT, just adding some contrast and saturation to the preview you see, makes it a lot easier to tell if your white balance is off. The final output you have for the edit is still gonna be that nice flat log footage with lots of detail, this is just a preview to help you when you're shooting. And finally, make sure you're always shooting at your camera's highest bit rate and bit depth so that if you do mess one of these up, you have like a fighting chance of pulling it back in post. One setting that I'm definitely guilty of not checking on as frequently as I should is aperture. Now you don't have to check this in between every single shot like you would with white balance or exposure, but it is important to make sure you keep an eye on your aperture 
when you're changing lenses. So if you're shooting on an F4 lens and then switch to an F1.4 lens, make sure you don't leave your camera at F4. You wanna take advantage of that 1.4, I mean, probably. A pretty quick solution to that is just to make sure that your camera's custom modes default back to your lowest aperture lens, which in my case is an F1.4. Another setting that you don't change that frequently, but that's still worth keeping an eye on is your ISO. Mainly, you should make sure you haven't bumped your ISO down below the native ISO. So for example, shooting at an ISO of 100 when your camera's native ISO is 640. Dipping below that native ISO can very quickly give you a noisier image with less dynamic range. Also, if your camera has a dual native ISO, for example, at 640 and 4000 like mine, make sure you're not shooting right below that upper native ISO. So for example, shooting at 3600 ISO, which is right below that 4000 native ISO and will give you like a terrible noisy image. So just give it a quick check make sure you're not doing that. Now, don't roll your eyes. I know it's kind of obvious, but you need to make sure your image is in focus before you start recording. You can make that easier by enabling focus peaking, which indicates which part of the scene is in focus, and by enabling the focus assist, which makes the screen kind of punch in when you move the focus ring to help you focus more precisely. Another thing I'll do frequently, even when shooting in manual focus, is briefly turn on the autofocus and just quickly catch focus right before I start recording. Everything we've talked about so far is a camera setting, aperture, ISO, frame rate, shutter speed. So let's move on and talk a bit about composition. Make sure your composition is correct before you press record. That means checking for distractions that could be creeping in around the edges of the frame and drawing the eye away from the subject. It means ensuring a comfortable amount of space between different subjects in the scene and between subjects and the edges of the frame. And it also means checking for like weird alignments, like making sure there's not like a tree poking out of someone's head, something like that, or a horizon line cutting someone off at the neck. And finally, ensuring precise alignment of your composition, like making sure the subject is either right in the center if they're center framed or right on one of the grid lines if you have them framed off to the side and making sure that the camera is level. You can make all that a lot easier by enabling the grid lines, enabling the center marker and enabling the level on your camera's display. Another quick check that I don't see mentioned very often is storage. Make sure that you have room for whatever you're about to record, especially if it's like a time lapse or a very long shot, like this talking head shot I'm recording right now is about half an hour long. There should be a number in the corner of the screen indicating the amount of space you have left on your card, how many more photos you can take, or how many more minutes and seconds of video you can record. So make sure that there's a reasonable amount of room in there for whatever you're about to do. Also format your card at the beginning of a long shoot day so you can make sure you have all of that space available for that shoot. Everything we've discussed in this video will help you to make sure that each individual shot is correct. But you should also look at everything you shoot in the broader context of whatever sequence or project you're working on and make sure that this shot fits. The most obvious version of that is continuity between shots, like making sure that if someone's wearing a hat in one shot, they're also wearing it in the next. But it can also mean consistency of motion, like if someone is moving through the scene from left to right, make sure in the next shot, they're not moving from right to left. You want them to move the same direction. Same thing goes for camera motion. You're probably not gonna wanna follow a shot pushing in with a shot pulling out. Another thing to look out for is like confusing composition changes. So for example, if you're shooting at a location that has mountains facing one direction and a forest if you face the other, you're probably gonna wanna shoot your entire sequence facing one of those two directions, unless you've like thoroughly established the geometry of the location early on in the scene. Otherwise, you could confuse the viewer, make them think that you're switching locations in the middle of the scene. And finally, after this entire video focusing on the look of your footage, we do need to talk about audio. I always have the audio meters displayed on screen while I'm recording, and I do two quick audio checks before I press record. The first is making sure the audio isn't too loud, taking a look at those levels, making sure nothing is peeking into the red, and also making sure that the correct microphone is recording. So I usually have an external mic going, so I'll give it a quick tap and then take a look at those meters, make sure that I can see those two spikes go up and that I'm not accidentally recording on like my camera microphone 
instead of this one. And before we go, there are a bunch of settings we didn't talk about in this video because they're kind of broader settings that will be consistent on pretty much everything you shoot. You're rarely gonna change these. Settings like bit rate and bit depth, picture profile, image stabilization, resolution, which shouldn't change in between shots. So you're gonna wanna make sure those are set on your preset mode dial so that your camera defaults back to those same settings. If all else fails, CC Force Motion Blur and After Effects and RSMB are great for adding motion blur. Neat Video works wonders for denoising grainy footage. You can usually punch in, reframe, rotate, and reverse shots to change composition and camera motion. And EQ and Denoiser can do a lot for spotty audio. But do try to get it right in camera. That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this video, learned something new from it. And if you did, be sure to subscribe to Adorama TV for thousands of other videos just like this one, including about 20 other videos in this series. So we go over like composition and lighting and outdoor photography and everything in between. I think you'll like it. Get out there, shoot something fun. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.